Good morning. Do we have sound? Hope we have sound. And welcome to this webinar on loop design from sunny California. I hope you're all enjoying our little cartoon. We started writing this cartoon when the lockdown stopped because nobody ever writes a cartoon just for electrical engineers. But here it is. And you can see our protagonist Ohm here studying uh, Maxwell's equations, doing a bit of yoga at the same time to try and increase the blood flow there. Um, could someone give me a sound check here, please? I'm not getting any feedback on that. John? Okay. Right. What we're going to talk about today, or we're actually going to do today, is to design and measure some control loops live during this one hour webinar. So we're gonna take a power supply that we've got designed and we're gonna measure its control to output transfer function, design the parts for the loop, and we're going to measure the loop gain offwards. I don't know if we can do all that in one hour, but we're certainly gonna give it a try for everybody. Please bear with us if the um, something goes wrong with the hardware here. Right. There's a file to download here. If you download the loopdesign.pdf, you will have a record of some of the results from this webinar that you can look at. Um, no need to follow along with that. It'll all be on your screen while we're doing this so you can see what is happening. And we've got a um, thousand people signed up for the webinar today from last time I counted was 59 different countries. So welcome everybody. I hope it's all okay where you are. You're keeping busy and um, lots of time to think and do different things, I think, uh, during this time. Um, but hope your businesses and everything is going okay wherever you are. Um, we're always available here for you. Uh, we have our website, RidleyEngineering.com, our design center where you can come and visit and you can send us questions and chat and join our groups. We'll talk more about that later. So let's talk about the loop design process. That's what we're here for. I don't know if this has ever been done before, someone actually closing a loop during a webinar, but um, I remember when I went uh, into industry for the first time and I uh, I just finished studying multivariable control and nonlinear control and I, I thought I was pretty advanced. And I remember doing problem sets from professors where they would give you multivariable system and you got full state feedback and then you could place the poles exactly where you wanted them and that was part of the problem set. If you're going to put your poles here and here, what kind of gains do you put on all these state variables to do the feedback? So when I went to work, I assumed that's what was going to happen and they put a power supply in front of me that looked like it was grabbing a little bit of current over here and a little bit of voltage and doing some things to it. So, so great, looks like full state feedback is going on and can somebody tell me where you'd like me to place the poles for this system please and of course no one could do that they said well we just want it to regulate and to be low output impedance we don't know where the poles are it's like oh okay then how do you do the design and they said well we have a little uh network analyzer from hp with a selective voltmeter for one frequency only at a time and you dialed it up and you measured just one signal and you drew vectors and you created a Bode plot. It's like, ah, Bode plot, yeah, I kind of remember that from school, but nobody ever told us we'd actually need that. And I assumed, of course, everything was a little bit out of date and that really wasn't the way to do it. But um, several months later, what was I doing? Measuring Bode plots because it's the only way to design in reality because of the different objectives we have with power systems that just don't work any other way in any other in any reasonable approach. So that's what I've been doing for almost 40 years now. Been lots of theory in there as well. But I've um, been closing loops on power stages through the, the the method of measurement. So what's my process? You know, everybody's a little confused about this loop process. What's open loop? What's closed loop? How are things working? When should we close the loop on a project? You know, how, how should we approach this system? 
and people get very wrapped around the axle on closing uh, closing loops, making measurements, and getting the system stable. And if you if you don't know how to do it, you can get stuck there, and it can crash your entire project. And it often gets left until the very last moment. So we kind of do a little bit of it much earlier than that. Um, so the first thing you do, of course, is you build your power stage. You've got to build that. And then you have the option when you build the power stage and you do your first board layout, your first prototype, do you populate the loop components or do you just leave them empty so you can start doing the design? So my approach to it is to close the loop slowly. I always run a closed loop power supply, but very low bandwidth. And I want to do that from day one when I power up the power supply, because when you're doing that, you're testing so many different things in the control system that um, can come back to bite you later if you don't try closing that loop. So we close the loop slowly. We have a standard little circuit we use for that, anywhere from a you know, little two watt supply to a multi kilowatt supply. Then you measure the power stage with a slow loop closed. So it's a closed loop system, but we're measuring the open loop control to output. Then you look at that, you characterize it at different points, and you're going to compare it with the theory. If you have theory, some converters, the theory on the LLC is not very good. Some people come up with LC, LC, different types of topologies that theory doesn't work so well. And even the simple converters, there are problems with the, um, with the theory, which is why in our industry, we still make measurements because I'd say 90% of the time, the measurement you make is not going to agree exactly with the theory, and you've got to work hard on the theory or just throw it away and just proceed with the measurements. Once you've got the power stage down, compared to the theory, and you're happy with the way the power stage is behaving, you design the compensator, then you measure the loop, and then you go back and measure the loop with the theory again, and hopefully everything is okay. And that's what we're going to try and do during this process. Now, it is important to get this loop closed slowly in your power supply because things will happen in the control and noise will creep in there. If you don't have your snubbers right, it can interrupt the operation of the controller and you need to know that early. But don't go full blown on the loop design because the power stage is going to be a little bit off anyway. So don't try to design that. Use, use some empirical during that process. So that's my process. That's what we're going to go through today. So here is a switching power supply. And this can be any kind of topology. It can be a flyback, which is what we're going to do today, forwards, bridges, LLC converters, anything can belong in here in the switching power supply. And frequencies any way you like. You know, a 10 kilo, 20 kilohertz converter, or you want to do 100 kilohertz or a megahertz, it's the same process for me. Here's the compensator that I always start with. And it's got a resistor divider, R1 and RB, that for this converter will set the output to 12 volts with a 5 volt reference. That's what's inside this control chip. These are big numbers, 150K, 100K. And the intent here is to just make your power supply regulate when you're first bringing it up and doing some testing on, on the system. You don't want to have to sit there tweaking a part to adjust the duty cycle, if you, which is what happens if you don't have some kind of closed loop going around the system. The feedback capacitor C1 is really big, about 4.7 mics, and I put a resistor in here, 100 ohms. There's a reason why that's in there as well that we'll talk about a little bit later. When you build this, assuming a power stage has 20, 30, 40 dB of gain, you're going to cross over a very low frequency somewhere below 10 hertz. So any, anything above 10 hertz, your power system is running open loop, but it's going to DC regulate. So you can do your tests of low line, high line, check out your converter operation over the full range of, um, of input and output. So that's how we close our loop slowly. And by the way, if you want to ask questions, feel, feel free to ask questions. And uh, we've got, um, We'll be answering. We've got a couple of people here answering the questions at the same time, and uh, I'll jump in and answer some questions every now and then when I'm putting some parts in ports. So there's our closed way to close the loop. Now, normally, when you close a loop gain, this is the classic signal injection method. 
So you will take the source of our frequency response analyzer, it's either an AP instruments or a Ridley box, go through an isolation transformer, and that injects differentially across a 20 ohm resistor that's going to be in series with that 150k. So this is how you inject into a loop. And if you're doing loop gain, you would measure D divided by A right here. The problem is we put a very low gain compensator in here. So if you try to inject this way and then you measure C, point C here, to the output, which would be our control to output, you just won't have any signal. The injected signal will get severely attenuated through this network here if you try to inject with the classic loop technique. So when we're building that slow loop with very low loop gain, it's not a good way to inject signal into the system and make a measurement. So what we do is this. And uh, there's other techniques for doing this, of course. There's other ways to do this. Um, we don't inject across this resistor anymore. We take the source of the analyzer and we put it through a network to mirror the feedback network. So that's a 4.7 microfarad, 100 ohm. I actually use a 4.7 mic and, a, and one K ohm in here. And you might ask, well, why don't you just put a 4.7 mic here and a 4.7 mic there? That's a really bad idea from an RF point of view. If you don't break the RF loops with a 1K resistor or a few hundred ohm resistor, your converter will probably go crazy and it might decide to blow up the power supply when you do that. So this is how we do it. We, we take the signal, inject in here, so this is basically unity gain at the beginning, and then it drops down to about a one-tenth gain with the two resistors later on. And then we put one probe here on the output of the error amp. We put another probe here on the output of the power supply. And then we sweep that across the frequency range of interest, and then we're going to measure the control to output transfer function. This is our flyback converter, just rough specs here. 36 volts in, 48, 60 is the range. It's a 24 watt converter, 12 volts, two amps. And we're gonna design it continuous conduction mode because it's a lot more interesting. Um, some people design their flybacks always discontinuous mode because they're terrified of continuous mode, right off plane zeros and all that stuff. So we designed one deliberately to have some more interesting characteristics. So let me show you a setup. I'm sorry, this is a bit kludgy doing this. I'm going to take my camera off here. <clears throat> show you our setup. This is our input power source. This is our power supply under test right here. And here we have all these card modules for building up prototypes very quickly. We've got a capacitor input. We've got the switches. We've got diode rectifiers, output cap and a transformer right here and this is our control card on this control card zoom in a bit there you can see those big blue capacitors that's the 4.7 mics for doing the injection and then we're hanging in the injection signal on that red clip lead there hanging onto a 1k resistor that's going to inject into the circuit so that is going to our ridley box here signal comes out Right here goes into the isolation transformer that's inside the box. Then the signal comes from the whoops output and injects into the circuit. We've got three probes hooked up. One probe is channel A. Is that the input to the loop that we're going to use later? One probe is channel C, is going to the output of the air amplifier. That's right here. And then one probe is channel D which is going to the output of the power converter. So there's our test set up for measuring control to output on the converter. Okay. Camera back. I'm gonna try and do two cameras next time, be more sophisticated. Okay. So now let's go make a measurement. And we're gonna to go to uh, Ridley works software. Here is our switching power supply, and it's got something like a 60 microhenry inductor, and I think it's got a 400 microfarad capacitor here, 4 milliohms. 
and it's running at 100 kilohertz. Click on the Ridley box. Oops, there we go. Clear the design. And now we're going to do a sweep. So we're sweeping the plant, control to output. So you click on this plant button here, and that sets up all the signal sizes, the input channel, the output channel, if you look at the settings here. The bandwidth is set, start frequency is 10 hertz, stop frequency is 200 kilohertz, input channel is C, that's the output of the air amplifier, and the output channel is D. Okay, and we're going to sweep. Sweep initiated. As you know, as you saw our new frequency response analyzer before, the uh, analyzer will talk to you as it's going. So that it lets you know the status. So there we go. Here we see it's sweeping now. Always start at 10 hertz. Why do you always start at 10 hertz? Because 10 hertz is less than line frequency. You see a lot of analyzers that don't do a good job down here. Some of the scope analyzers, some of the cheaper analyzers don't do a good job at 10 hertz. So they're going to start at 100 hertz or 1 kilohertz to distract you. You must measure 10 hertz. That's why all the H old HP instruments always start at 10 hertz because of where the line frequency is. And if you can hear my power supply singing there, there we are sweeping the, loop, the control to output. So it's got about 20 dB of gain. It's got an LC filter here that looks pretty damped. Then it goes down with a minus two slope for a while and then a minus one slope eventually. And here is the switching frequency. So that's the noise that comes in. We see our phase wrapping here. Phase goes down to minus 180 and it keeps on going below minus 180 and jumps up here. I, I like to see the jump because I can see when it's go below minus 180. So we, we don't unwrap in this particular plot although of course we can do that that's the sign of a right half plane zero you've got more than 180 degrees phase delay out of the um out of the lc filter how does this look if you're just measuring blind and you haven't done this before it's like well i don't know if that's good or not so now we jump back to ridley works and you are using voltage load control loop here and we don't want to invert that. Here is our measurement versus prediction. Okay, so the blue curve here is the prediction, and the purple curve here is the measurement. And you see it's really good here. It's really good here. Right here around the resonance, it's not so good. It's not so good because every time you measure a voltage mode power stage, which is what this is, you're always going to miss on the damping. So the Q of the filter here is always wrong. Now we've worked really hard on this. So this has got my equations in it. And then I spoke to Dr. Volperian, who derived all the switch models for our field, said, hey, Fachi, <laughs> the damping's not right. Can you help? And he gave me his best equations for doing the damping, which is rolled into our program here, but we're still missing. And this is not a small miss. This is 10 dB at the resonant frequency. So if you're a graduate student or a professor, well, off you go. Go write your uh, master's dissertation or PhD dissertation to try and get the damping right. If you're working in the field or you've got one hour to close the loop, you say, well, you know, it's kind of peaking there and my, my converter's not. I'm going to ignore that prediction and just say, okay, well, I'm going to cross over out here anyway where the two are pretty close to each other. So I spent a lot of time in my life thinking about this damping issue, and I'm pretty sure this is all about switching losses and switching transitions. So as the converter rings there, it rings to a high current, the switching time changes a little bit during that time. That's almost like a little tiny bit of current feedback in the system. Put a little current feedback in, what does that do? it starts damping this resonance. Does anybody have a better model? No, they don't. There are no better models for this because it's so tedious to try and analyze that and it's only gonna be right for one particular converter. But there's our first attempt at measuring the loop. Uh, not measuring the loop, measuring the power stage. Looks, looks pretty good. Let's go back here and now we're gonna save that, save that data seat. So that is 36 volts in. 
Alt input, save. And then we're going to turn up the input to 60 volts, which I have a second camera here, so you can see that. But trust me, it's gone up to 60 volts now, and we will sweep again. Sweep initiated. So you're going to make a whole family of curves from low line to high line and probably several points in between. You're trying to find input lines at which things don't behave properly, and you will find those. Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this problem that a certain range of operation of your power supply, you suddenly hear it. It starts hissing at you, or it makes makes an audible noise that is not instability at this point, but it's a noise issue from snubbers, or RF noise just gets in there. And you want to try and work these out early before we design the loop properly. So that, that's what we're looking for here. So we'll do a family of curves from low line to high line. You can probably hear that one ringing a little more. When the input voltage gets higher, you hear more noise coming out of it. So that is our high line response. Go back to the program. Sweet complete. And now you see how it's moved versus the original prediction. The resonant frequency has shifted a bit. The gain has shifted a bit. So if I take my prediction up to the maximum, there you go. Now they lay on top of each other again. So this is a nicely behaved converter where at low line, high line, it's behaving quite well. We can make one more measurement. We'll turn off one load at high line and see what happens with that. So let's save that data set. The volts input. Save that one and sweep it again. Sweep initiated. When you're using these um, scope-based analyzers, it's quite interesting. The first point takes a long time because all the auto ranging has to go on, and after that point, things seem to seem to settle down and everything sweeps at a reasonable speed. So we can't really see. Oh, wait a minute, something's changing there. You see, the gain is dropping down a little bit here. Ah, what's going on there? So we've gone to half load, high line. And there we go. So it's changed. The converter has changed and it's moved into discontinuous conduction mode. So these are three transfer functions for the same converter, different line load condition. Jump back into Ridley Works. Now we see predicted versus measurement is terrible because we're not predicting discontinuous mode. Let's take the power level down a bit. The 12 watts. There you go. Discontinuous mode kicks in a little bit further. 16 watts, 14, 12. There you go. And to me, if you ever see a power stage that looks this good in your lab, you're doing really, really well. Because rarely do they behave this well. We worked, we worked hard on these converters and board layouts to get this to happen. We don't have multiple outputs. As soon as you have multiple outputs, these models kind of go out the window. Notice that we're not trying to match things out here at 20 kilohertz and beyond. Okay, you 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 will spend weeks in the lab trying to get this better. Okay, are we good within the bandwidth of where we're going to control it? Yes, we are. It looks solid there. So that's what we're talking to. Okay, now what we want to do is design. Let's go back to back to the box. Go back to full power. It's two loads on. Sweep it again. Sweep initiated. So we're going to go back into Ridley Works here, and what we want to do now is while that's sweeping, you can actually come back in here and uh, design again. So let's go back to uh, full load, max load. Okay, there's our full load. And one really nice thing is happening here with this test setup that we've got is that the data is just flowing live into your Excel spreadsheet. Okay, so your analyzer is busy doing its thing. It takes a little time to sweep. 
we can get on with our work while it's doing that. So let's look at what the compensation would be. So turn on the compensator for this. Okay. And that green curve there, coincidentally, it's laying over the DCM curve, but uh, that'll go away in a second. The green curve here is kind of an inversion of the power stage. It's got an inverter here, sorry, an integrator here. Then it's got two zeros where the power stage has two poles. Then it's got a couple of poles where the power stage has a couple of zeros. So you're just mirroring the poles and the zeros of the power stage with the poles and the zeros of the compensator. So we want to implement this kind of compensation on the system. And you can see it's an interesting characteristic here. It starts with gain of about 100, 10 hertz. Down here, just below the kilohertz, it's actually got no gain. It's zero dB, just a gain of one. It's because the power stage has gain. And beyond that, we raise the gain with frequency. That's two zeros coming in. That's differentiation of the signal, which we have to do with an LC filter. And then we roll it off again here really important on your compensator. I see people talking about PID controllers and things like that. If you don't knock the gain down at the end, the noise gets right through, or the ripple gets through, or the RF noise gets through, and not, nothing works. So we never really have a PID. We've got a type two or a type three. And we've got our poles and zeros here. So here's our loop design. So we've got two zeros, see in the green, two poles here also see in that green curve and then here's the crossover frequency crossover is chosen as either one tenth switching or some fraction of the right half plane zero that's what's constraining that these two zeros live right around the, the resonance the filter and these two poles are out at half the switching frequency so we've got some good caps in there and we don't need to attenuate you know too early so that's our whole zero shaping that we do. Notice we're not giving you any math here. There's no math, it's all in our program, or it's all in the shape. You're just matching shapes. That's what engineering is. It's not, it's not pure math, it's not math CAD, it's just get on with it by looking at curves. That's the way we design. Let's look at our compensation. And let me clear the values to start with. Show you where we start here. So here are the values of this compensator. So when you push around those poles and zeros, it will automatically fill in the R's and C's that you need for the compensator. And there are seven R's and C's in here. And one of them is a free variable, it's not constrained. So you can set the impedance of the entire network by choosing one of the components arbitrarily. And we do that with R2 here, okay, which is set at 5K. Now, when I look at all the values in here, I say, okay, R2 is gonna be 5K. I see that R3 is gonna get quite low, 370 ohms. Now, you won't, find, <clears throat> you won't find this in the data sheets, but if your R3 here starts connecting the output voltage to the input of an op amp with just a couple of hundred ohms, most analog controllers don't like that. They don't behave well. So don't let this value get too low. Sometimes I see a schematic where there is no R3. They just put a coupling cap across here. Bad idea in my book. I never do that. I always got to block the RF with that resistor. I'm going to raise that value a bit with a 10K. And click update. And then it's going to recalculate all my values again. But let's go massage the design a bit so I'm not using a can design that I have in here. Let's look at my poles and zeros. You say, okay, look, I got 54 degrees in here. Maybe I don't need that much. Maybe I want to be a bit more aggressive. I want to lift up the gain, low down. So let me bump this up a little bit. Let's take that out. And now you see your phase margin dropping to 57 degrees. Let's bump this zero up too. I'm going. And let's make sure we check the loop at low line. Right here. Use this form to redesign the loop. Okay, so now you see we've only got 49 degrees of phase margin. If I keep going here, 47, 45, 
phase margin is less than 45 degrees. Okay, we put this little ver verbal warning in the program. If you go below 45, hey, watch out. You're on your own. But people go there. We can design that way. We'll take a look at the loop width. So let, let's let's go with that value, just because. Now we look at our compensation components again. Got 10k here, 23k, 17k. This is now up to 800 ohms, so I'm happier with that. 9 nanofarad, 4 nanofarad, 330 picofarad, basically. Okay. Loop design is not a precision exercise. People obsess over, well, I don't have, you know, a 0.792K resistor. Only two of these values matter, R1 and RB. That sets the DC value. So let's go choose a value we have, 22K. Update. Now he says, okay, 22K, 15K, these will be 1% or 0.1% precision resistors. Everything else, 20% is fine. 40% is probably fine. It's not going to make a big deal of difference. So these pole zeros don't have to be precise. Got a lot of leeway on this, a lot of slop on this. Only these two resistors here have to be exact. Right. So now what I'm going to do is turn off my input power supply. And then you don't have the advantage of doing this, but we have a little control card right here. Okay, and we're going to pull out our compensation parts, which are the slow loop. There and there. There and there. Hey, John, you got any uh, questions for me to answer while this while I'm doing this? Why does the model go out the window with multiple outputs? Well, another way to answer that question. Why is it that you don't see any papers with multiple outputs? There are very, very few and far between. And the reason you don't see any papers with multiple outputs is because the models go out the window with multiple outputs to answer your question. But it doesn't answer why. So basically, you get down to... If it's you know a coupled inductor output, the modeling of the coupled inductor is hugely important for a coupled transformer and leakage between the windings gets involved in the control loop. No one's modeled it. No one's modeled it. It's too hard and it just doesn't come out right. So you won't see any papers and you know you, you just sometimes you get a good result, but then sometimes it just kind of falls apart. And that's why you just, as I say, you just don't see many university papers talking about multiple outputs. All right. Any others, John? Is it? Yeah. Is it in, uh, Let's see. My R2 is 10K. All right. Well, this is going a bit slow. Remember now, you're probably spending three weeks on your loops. We're going to try and do it in 10 minutes here. Plug in different components. This is my R2, 10K. camera dwell on each of the so if it's a little bit longer, some people have slow bandwidth. And oh, okay. Okay. So, yeah. And then, if you're all bearing with me here on this, this is an 820 ohms for the R3, close enough to 740. Got some leads off here. For those of you who haven't done this before, if you've got sockets on your board and you plug parts into the sockets, cut the leads as short as you can. Two reasons for that. One is that RF noise gets picked up by long leads. And two, long leads will tend to wander and drift and touch each other and short out your circuit. Now we're only doing a little 24 watt converter here. <clears throat> So it wouldn't matter too much, but if you're doing a 10 kilowatt converter and playing these games, keep everything short and neat. Okay, so that's all our resistors on the board there. Zoop, zoom up it. That's our R1, RB, R2, and R3. Now I need my C1, which is 10 nanofarads. It's close enough on that. There's my 10. C1 goes there, that's in the feedback network. And then C2 is four. 
4.7 or 3.9, it doesn't really matter. 4.7. And then we need a 330 picofarads. Last one. All right, everybody's still with us. We didn't see people going away, so that's good. Maybe you're having a cup of coffee. So last capacitor going in the board. And those of you that have been to our workshop will have done this. You'll have seen the uh, systems where we have little sockets on our control board. And, <clears throat> ah, can't see the holes. And when you build your circuits, you know, first you've got to get used to this idea that you're not going to build the final compensation on your main PC board. <clears throat> you're going to leave the parts open or put in the slow parts. And then when you get to the next level of enlightenment and designing converters, you put sockets on the board to do exactly what I'm doing. Because you're going to be changing these parts a lot. <clears throat> so in our, <clears throat> in our hands-on labs, people will spend the whole afternoon playing around with their compensation. They'll run into noise issues. They'll want to push the loop gain harder. Put sockets on the board. Makes your life much easier. Okay, plug in. <clears throat> and now we inject across that little feedback resistor. So let me pull my camera again. I'll go a bit slower on the circuit for you this time. So now we've plugged in our control board right here. Everything's populated with the loop gain components. And the injection signal, this probe and this one, go differentially across 20 ohm resistor. Now we've already got Kate probes hooked up to the circuit. So we've got a scope probe here, which is the output of the loop, a scope probe here, which is the input of the loop. And then last time we used this probe here, which is the output of the compensator. So now we've got to switch which two probes we're going to use to measure the actual loop gain on the system. Okay. <clears throat> By the way, on our board, you also see some snubbers. Okay. Notice I left long leads on there, violating my own rule. We always design the snubbers before the control, because if you don't put good snubbers in, your control chip doesn't work. Again, that's an unadvertised feature of the control chips from just about everybody. If you don't suppress the RF noise by putting snubbers in, you know, it's going to interfere with your control circuit. Lots of gain. It will misbehave. Right. Let's bring the power supply up again. And 20 volts in. It looks like it's regulating. We're at low light. Okay. Go back to our analyzer. And now we want to measure a loop. So click on loop gain. Use this Wrigley box setup for measuring loop gains. Okay, so it tells you what kind of circuit to use. It shows you where to look up, hook up the probes. It shows you which channels to use. That's quite important if you're looking for high gain. And um, you know, we'll give you all this verbal feedback. We'll have a lot more help notes as time goes on for doing all these kinds of things. But there you go, that's our hookup. So we set that up, click on settings. You see it's changed the input channel to A, the output channel to D. This is a four channel analyzer, so you can change A, B, C. Click on it, C. Go back to A again. Okay, that's where we're starting. We're doing a loop injection. So when you click on the loop setup, it will always choose a variable source. And the variable source has an initial amplitude. Here it's four volts peak to peak, final amplitude of 100 millivolts. It's the low frequency break, the high frequency break. So that just contours the injected signal. If you don't do that, you can't see the gain at low frequencies. And if you keep the signal fixed with a high, high signal, then it overdrives the circuit at um, as you approach the crossover frequency. So there you go that and let's try another sweep sweep initiated so now we're sweeping the loop with lower bandwidth we drop the bandwidth down to 10 hertz 
it was 100 hertz for control to output because both of the signals are big size. Here you can see in the loop, we've got about 60 dB of gain. So when we're injecting a four volt peak to peak, it goes through our transformer, which attenuates it. Maybe it's one volt peak to peak afterwards. Then it gets attenuated by a 20 ohm resistor. And then that, so that signal is a few tenths of a volt. And then the other signal is 60 dB down. Okay, so you've got a few tenths of a millivolt on the second signal. And frankly, it's uh, quite remarkable that these machines can measure this, you know, 60 dB on here. The limit of the Ridley box is about 70. The limit of the AP instruments is about 90 to 100 dB. And it's very important when you look at these, not these signal range um, numbers, it's got to be in the presence of noise. Okay, the hard part about measuring these systems, which is why you can't do it with just a signal analyzer, is you've got little tiny signals, enormous amounts of switching noise in there. So we're cutting right through it here. You can see it's sweeping the loop a little slower this time because of the restricted bandwidth. By the way, you can change the bandwidth to anything you like. If you want one hertz, you can have it. If you point one, 0.1 hertz, you can have that too. Anywhere you want to go with the bandwidth on this. Okay. Now let's see how that's doing versus our prediction. So here we're predicting the compensator, the power stage. Now let's turn on the loop. That's the red one. Now let's turn off the other stuff just because. Turn off the power stage and the compensator. We're just left with the loop gain. So now you can see the prediction and the measurement here up to this frequency now. It's so close that you can't even see the purple curve behind the red curve. The phase is not so good, it's like 180 degrees off. And that's because this injection technique needs you to flip the phase. So you click on that button, flip the phase. Okay, so these are tied nicely. This is tied nicely in this region. Here, we've got some deviation because it's having trouble resolving much above 60 dB of gain, or it may be the op amp is running out of steam. We're not really sure which. Around the resonant frequency, of course, the real circuit is more damped than the measured circuit. Sorry. Yeah, the measured circuit, the real circuit is more damped than the prediction. So we get differences in the phase right here. And then we're coming out towards crossover. And you see they're both quite nicely in agreement at that point. Okay, so we get a nice agreement on the loop gain between the predicted and the measured. Sweeping along, taking a little time there. Am I happy with this? I am. Is your program manager happy with this phase variation? Well, he's giving you a lot of work if he's not happy with that. Okay. As we come further out here, you want to make sure once you've crossed over, it's got to keep going down. So I want to see at least 10 dB gain margin. Now it's heading down towards minus 20 dB on the gain margin. So I'm really happy with that. So it keeps on sweeping. So that looks good. All right. Let me just look at some of your questions here. Any special ones, John? Is it? Flag one, is the same approach applicable to power stage connected in parallel of the input and output? Yes, it is, absolutely. You can't measure the current loops, but you're closing an inner current loop, and then you measure the same output loop gain of the system. And you can also do it with digital control as well. Okay, asking your digital processor to be a frequency response analyzer, yes, you can sometimes, but it's not gonna be a very good one. So verification phase, most of the digital control companies out there that do these power supplies, they, they have one of our analyzers to, to confirm that they're getting the right, the right looping. So you see here around the switching frequency, it's got a blip up. Do I worry about that? No, I don't. Do I call this the gain margin? No, I don't. This is just noise coming through the power switch. Okay. In your view, what's the best book to understand power supply control of theory? Uh -huh. I don't know. I have a book here on my desk. It's computer controlled systems, but there's hundreds of them, thousands of them. Um, come read our design center. There's lots of things on control of design there. Play around with our software. This will teach you a huge amount about control. 
So we have, you know, all the all the all the equations for the control transfer functions for the power stage are in here. For the compensator are in here. And you can play around pushing the gain up, pushing the gain down. When you read a textbook, it's going to be dry and it's going to be boring. And you're not going to be able to do things like, you know, move the input from minimum to maximum and watch the gain shift. Okay, you can't see that in a textbook. You can't watch the power go down and then hit discontinuous mode. Okay, you can see the equations, but here in the software, and we have the free demo version of the software, you can see these effects coming into play. It's like, oh, okay, look at that curve change there. And it's a much more lively interaction in understanding the control control theory. Somebody has asked, electrolytic capacitors age over time and get increased ESR. Right. So you have to design your compensator with plenty of margin. This is where phase margin comes in. Some people will argue about 50 degrees. It's like, hey, if you can give me 80 degrees, 90 degrees, I'll take it. If I can cross over at one kilohertz instead of 10 kilohertz to stay away from the cap ESR, do that, okay? You've got to predict what the aging is going to be. And of course, with an electrolytic, you've got to do the temperature range. So you will go in here in your measurements. So we've stored two power stages here, and now we're going to store a loop gain. So this is loop, loop 36 volts, save it. Okay, we saw that was quite clean. Let's change our bandwidth here to make it go a bit faster. Let's go to 100 hertz bandwidth. Crank up the input, 60 volts. Sweep again. Sweep initiated. So we're sweeping the, the loop again under different line conditions. So your job when you've got your loop closed on your power stage is you're in the lab for about a week collecting every possible permutation of input line, output load, temperature. Obviously we can't do age. And then you'll have multiple units. You'll try and test more than one to make sure everything is behaving, you know, behaving well. And then you've just got to predict where that's going to go in the in the future. So there you go, sweeping faster this time. But if you can hear the clicking coming from the circuit, see the resonance has shifted there, right there. The gain here is crossing over at put out zero dB marker on it. So that gain is crossing over at nine kilohertz. And the yellow curve, if we attach to that, point zero dB, that's down around uh, five kilohertz. So a big change between the yellow and the purple. So this is the variation you've got to capture in all your testing. Okay, so let's save that one. Data set four, that's loop. 60 volts, volts, okay, all right, one more, we're going to turn off a load and measure it one more time, sweep, sweep initiated, uh, can I show the effects of input filter on the gain phase of the converter, not in this not in this uh, webinar. We're going to do an entire webinar on the input filter. And lots of people talk about input filters. They do little webinars about input filters. But basically, nobody's done anything new on the input filter since Middlebrook discovered it in the late 1970s. Um, we have a webinar we're going to do on actually compensating the input filter with your controller, which I don't think anybody has done. We're not going to damp the input filter. We're going to actively control the input filter. I think that's going to be our next webinar. I've got a lot of preparation for that one. And um, the theory is we can take the PWM control and control not the power stage itself, but actually go start controlling the resonance of the input filter. It's a, it's a really fascinating system. Okay, what do we have here? This is discontinuous mode. It's like, uh-oh, I don't like this one much. So this is our data set. One, two, three, four, five, I believe. So 60 volts input. B, C, safe. Okay, so there you go. Now, if I get rid of those first two curves, which are the power stage, so let's get clear data set one and data set two. That's your variation in loop for this power system. 
Okay, so you've got to ask yourself, am I happy with that much change in the system? So it's got low crossover frequency. Does it have good phase margin? Well, it's uh, yeah, it's 64 degrees phase margin on that. It's actually better than these other two, but you're a little worried here that this is kind of bumping up again. So I'd be a little concerned about that pink curve there. Doesn't look too good to me. And you've got to do a lot more measurements down at even lighter load than that sunny half load. So you go down to 10% load. Are all your curves good? If you don't like this collapse of gain in the system with DCM, what do you do? Make it current mode. Make it current mode, then this problem goes away. It also gets rid of the unpredictable damping in the um, LC filter if you go to a current mode approach. Let's go look at that last one. There you go. So there's our loop measured versus prediction for DCM. Okay. And um, the DCM models, they're, they're okay, but they don't do a great job. You will get a lot of variation. If ever you see something coming in like pulse skipping, every now and then it skips a pulse, you can't measure the loop anymore. Okay, so be very careful when you go in DCM. Make sure you've tested, characterized as much as you can over all these different ranges of operation. Okay, can I elaborate on the equation for the power stage prediction? Well, there it is. No, it's not. Let's go full mode, full load. This case here is the power stage prediction. Okay. This is okay. This is this is straight out of um for Perian's work with his PWM switch model going back to 1986. So you know it's it's in our software, which is the easiest place to find it. You can go to Basso's books, which derives it, you know, 700 equations to get there. So if you love equations, you know, you can go there. This is all you really need, quite honestly, for that. Yeah, flag question there. Can we measure the Bode plot of an already designed power supply that doesn't have an injection resistor? <laughs> no, you can't. Put the injection resistor in, okay? If you're designing your power supply, okay, put the injection resistor in onto the PC board because later on, someone's gonna wanna come and measure it. They're gonna ask that same question. So you've got to cut the traces on the board or you've got to lift components. The reason I say you always put the injection resistor in is because it forces the PCB layout designer to bring the signal up to the top layer to let you open it. If you don't do that, often you can't get at the trace that you need to to do the injection. And nowadays, a lot of the demo boards are doing, um, you know, 402 components. Um, one right here. So here you go. Here's the answer to your question. This is a demo board from Linear Technology. And let's see if I can hold that up there. You can see that up here is an array of 402 resistors. I hate these things. They're crazy. They drive you nuts. And then what we've had to do is we've got to tack on some red wire, put an injection resistor in it, stick up a couple of leads to do the injection. Okay. Would it have killed them to put a 20 ohm resistor on the board and a test pad? No, it wouldn't, but they saved a part. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's a false economy, if you ask me. Just, just put the resistor on there. But this is the kind of process you have to go through if they don't have the injection resistor on the board. Sorry, there's no there's no way around that. Okay. Any more flag there, John? I've been doing some political ones here, but. Um... Transit, uh, larger phase margin. Okay, talking about phase margin, I always want to have at least 10 dB, probably more like 20 dB. And this this is to avoid the variation in the system. Things are going to change over time. The ESR of the cap is going to change over time. One unit versus another is going to change. So by putting in at least 10 dB, you say, okay, well, you can change it a factor of three before it's going to start to worry me. Now, the other thing about gain margin that most people don't know that you could explore with our program is even after the loop has crossed over, the loop still affects the output impedance. And it still affects the, uh, the, the noise rejection. If you don't have enough gain margin, you will see it will actually lift up and it'll give you a peak in the output impedance. 
if you don't have enough gain margin in the system. So don't assume you've crossed over, don't worry about anything now. Everything matters. If it stays close to zero dB, it will push up and pull and on, on the output impedance and give you resonances and things that you don't want in the system. That's why we look for you know a really good gain margin. I think I did that in one of the previous webinars where we talked about you know pushing the loop too hard and not having enough gain margin. We could see the peaking in the output impedance of the system. Flag one for, one for me. Can't see it. A lot of questions. There you go. Current mode control, do you simply multiply the control to output transfer function of the power stage with the double pole transfer function that you have in current mode? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's been since 1990 since I did this, but uh, let's look at the You're loop here. Let's look at the control mode. Voltage mode selected. And make it current mode. Current mode selected. Now we'll look at the power stage, and there's your equations. So I, I, I'm not sure exactly what your question is there, but you see a zero, two zeros, and a pole, and then another double pole, which comes out of my PhD dissertation. Okay, so that's a question of current loops interacting with, uh, with the control to output transfer function. EMI filters, to say, we'll do that in our next webinar, because it's very important. People get into trouble with EMI filters. If you see a glitch in your loop gain, that's the EMI filter most of the time. And it means you've got to damp it. You've got to lower its impedance, or you've got to put a big cap across the input to make it stable. But we'll we'll talk about that in a in a few weeks. Multiple crossover points. Well, try to not do that. Uh, that's usually caused by filters in the system, extra filters that make it cross over and then blip up and cross over again. You've got to damp the filters. You want, you want to. Mode. That's a different webinar. Yeah, we'll do, we'll repeat this webinar if you'd like. So please give us some comments. Do you want us, we'll do this again with current modes. So the current mode, what we're going to do is measure control to output, just like we just did. Close the current loop, measure control to output again. So now we see the direct effect of closing the current loop on the system. Okay, so what we would see there, let's look at the power stage. Turn off the loop gain. The phase margin is less than 45 degrees. And that's the measurement. There, there's our control to output current mode. And then there's the control to output. Voltage mode. Selected. Voltage mode. Voltage mode, current mode. Current mode selected. Okay. That's why I'm saying, if you know, if somebody asks me about which book should I read to study this, use the software. Here it is, okay, it's a visual, voltage mode, current mode. You just bounce voltage back and forth, and you can see the single pole or the three poles versus the double pole. And you just learn a lot by looking at these curves and tweaking the gains up and down of the system. Gyrator recap transformer models. Well, if you like those, um, that's not my thing. I don't know much about gyrators. Okay, makes me think of a helicopter of some kind with a man sitting on it. Well, I think it's a gyrocopter though. Bernard uh, <laughs> Dio just re asked his question. I'll flag it for you. Okay. Yeah. Which one is that? Uh, it'll be the lowest one for me. We've got hundreds of questions coming here. We're going to try and get back to questions. Uh, current mode control. Do you multiply the control to output transfer function of the power stage? Well, no, you divide it. It's the forward gain of the power stage divided by one plus the loop gain. Okay, so you've got the LC filter, and then it gets divided by the same LC filter plus the, the double zero, and that double zero becomes a double pole. So you've got forward gain divided by the loop gain, so the, a division that goes on in that system. It's fairly complex, but the results actually are quite elegant and simple. Okay, I hope that answer answers it. You multiply it by the inverse of one plus loop gain. Uh, yeah, you. <laughs> John John says over there you multiply the inverse of one plus the loop gain. It's the same thing. So if you want to use the word multiply, there you go. It's the inverse. <laughs> one plus d sub s. Yeah. 
what's the bandwidth? The bandwidth is one tenth the switching frequency or one half the right half plane zero is our criteria. As the switching frequencies go to a megahertz, you may be constricted by the gain of the op amp. Okay, so you know when we look at the compensation here for this system, it's not very demanding on the op amp. You see out here, it's got a it's asking for 20, 30 dB of gain. If I were 10 times the frequency on this converter, I would need to lift the op amp up, and it'd be much more likely to run into the gain bandwidth limitation of the op amp. So if you're shooting for a 100 kilohertz crossover, that is usually your limitation, is the actual op amp itself, which restricts you. But one tenth of switching frequency is the industry norm for an aggressive loop. One hundredth is quite common to see in industry. People are worried about these ESRF caps, the aging of the system. So they say, you know what, we're just gonna put a load of cap on the system, cross over really low frequency. We're not even gonna push to this one tenth switching frequency anymore. Oh, this is a good one, right? Yeah. Near the bottom. Yeah. Good Lord, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> How do we encourage universities to buy your software? Well, just, uh, I, I don't know what to say. Um, we have a free version to try, so you can certainly try it. I would love to see all the universities out there teaching with our software. I mean, this is a great way to learn the first pass on closing control loops for, for many kinds of systems, not just power converters. Uh, we, we will make our software available to the universities. They won't even have to, you know, to, to spend any money on it. But it requires a mindset change of the professors. So if you go to a professor and say, hey, how about using this design software? You know, they've got to, they've got to rewrite their notes. And that's really, really hard to do. I know that. I've got course notes and I know what it's like to rewrite them. Um, so that really is the obstacle. You know, it's not, it's not us. We're willing to work with the universities. We've had two universities take us up on that so far. Uh, neither of them in, in the in the U.S. Um, as I say, they, they're, they're so busy on research and other things they're doing that you know changing course notes in the university curriculum is hard for them. So, and if you come up with any ideas, I would love to love to see what they are to try and solve that problem because I, I think everybody should be teaching converters with this software. Why why would you do it any other way? It's just the easiest way to do it. It's so much easier than looking up in a textbook. Okay, we have reached our 10 o'clock point. I'll just jump back to my, everything is in here in the presentation. So we summarized all those things. If you want to learn more, our workshops, they will resume one of these days. We're not sure when yet. Um, we're going to have some other alternatives there too. Ridley Works, you can get the free demo. Okay, Go to our website, readyengineering.com. You can download the free demo and get used to this software. If nothing else, use it to design your compensate. Okay, it's amazing the amount of work you can do with it. Uh, frequency response analyzers, everything, this whole webinar is running off the Ridley box. All the software, Excel is running off the Ridley box. The webinar itself is running, the camera, the microphone, and then we're sweeping loops at the same time. That's all coming out of this little box here that's got the computer inside it. Got a nice pair of HDMI monitor uh, monitor connections for it. So you got two screens up there for doing layouts. So that's our you know workhorse analyzer. Um, if you're in aerospace, you need the calibration mill certification. You need just the higher level of you know performance with high drive and go down to 0.01 hertz for free, for PFC circuits. We have of course the AP analyzer available. So but both of these you can read about on our website and compare them. And come to our Facebook group. We've got about four and a half thousand engineers on the Facebook group, and everybody hates Facebook, but they run really good groups. So you just come in, you don't have any friends, you don't interact, don't put anything personal, just come to our group. And lots and lots of good questions come up there about design. The questions you're asking here will cover many of these things, okay? Uh, free book, car mode. Just go click on that link in your PDF file. It will take you to the page and you can download the free book on current mode. So you're all set on that. That's uh, 250 pages of fun mathematical reading. And Power Supply Design Center articles. We talk about crossover frequencies, how to choose that. A lot of the questions I'm seeing popping up now are you know, in our Design Center articles. 
I see a question. What's the difference between the loop gain measurement and the power stage measurement? Good question. Let me just zoom back to that. Okay, loop gain measurement is D over A. So we're injecting into the loop through the compensator, through the power stage to the output. That's the loop. Power stage is cutting out the controller part. It's just going from here to the output. So when I made those two different measurements, notice I didn't move any probes on the circuit. Because we got a four channel analyzer here, you just software configure which, which channel you, you want to look at, and then you get the different measurements here. Okay. So that was that one. And then this is our Ridley box, everything that's in the Ridley box. Ridley works lifetime license, four channel analyzer, and it's a four channel scope as well. Uh, I don't know why anybody would uh, not, not use one of these things. These are these are great. So you can you know measure the loop. If something's going wrong, you just turn it over to be a scope. You go look at the waveforms, and then you come back in again, use it as an analyzer. And of course, we are interacting with our software. Everything is designed to flow into our software to compare with the design process and the prediction process of all the power stages. Um, if you find yourself digging through looking for transfer functions of power stages, okay. I mean, you, you, you will dig forever and you will find multiple textbooks and you will find multiple equations within those textbooks that disagree with each other. Just use us as a reference here. Click on the power stage details. Here are the poles and zeros. Here's the equations for the poles and zeros. Okay, so this is a really nice collection point for all of those equations. I say, if you go into one textbook versus another, everybody has, all the professors have it, slightly different notation on all their parts. So they might call R capital L might be R small L. R small L might be the ESR of the inductor for somebody else. You know, the R here might be the load resistor, which I call R big L. Some people just call that R. So it's all over the place. It, it, you will go absolutely nuts looking for the equations, finding the right ones. So we got the right ones in here. Use this as a reference to help you on that. Just flagged another one for the record. Flagged another one there. And bottom or up the top. Awesome. How to assess the stability of constant on time regulars where switching frequency is not fixed? No problem. Just go into our current mode book here. And we do constant off time, constant on time, variable frequency. If you're making measurement, then the measurement doesn't care. I mean, everything is basically fixed frequency, set steady state point, and you're just perturbing a little bit around there. There's just a small difference in gain, basically, with the variable frequency controllers, but not, nothing changes. You know, this whole process I've been through here, it doesn't matter what kind of converter you've got, what kind of controller you've got. It could be an LLC, it can be a phase shifted full bridge, it can be any kind of converter. You go through the same process. So step one, the power stage is up and running and clean, it's not blowing up anymore. Measure the transfer function of the power stage. Okay. Get out of LT spice, get out of your prediction, get out of MathCAD, go measure it. Because all your predictions will fail first time through. So get those measurements early, early on. Okay. You need a frequency response analyzer to be in this business. It's it's crazy. You know, here we are. We've done, we've closed the loop in half an hour basically, because half an hour was me talking with my hands, and we actually implemented a loop here. Okay, that's how fast you should be able to do it. And some of you I know, if you don't have a frequency response analyzer, you're just you're just completely blind to what you're doing. You just cannot see where to go when things go wrong. You have no tools. It's like trying to debug where your switch is blowing up without an oscilloscope. Okay, so this is, this is a crucial piece of lab test equipment. And as you see here, you're buying your time. This is valuable, you know, time that you're, you're saving weeks and weeks by having the proper tool to get through in just, uh, you know, less than an hour on this. Any other ones on there? Ridley Works doesn't model some of these things. Yeah, of course it doesn't. But one thing we have from Ridley Works is we dump our models into LT Spice. And then inside LT Spice or, or PSIM, you can modify those models. So if you've got something different going on with your controller, 
go put that in the LT Spice version or the PSIM version. And then you can get your transfer functions that way. At some point, yeah, you have to break away from the need to have the equation because some of these control systems, you know, even when you put something like simple like the TL431, you create very, very complex control loops on it. And you do a little bit of feed forward of the voltage. You know, nobody has built these models. So as a working engineer, you realize you can't wait for the model. You can't go get a PhD dissertation in the model. You've got to get on with it. You've got to measure. If you're a multiple output converter, the, the results are usually pretty unsatisfactory compared to the measurements. You have to go with the measurements unless your program gives you a year to, you know, get a master's degree and research that particular converter. But then, of course, you change one little thing about the operating point, and that small signal model has gone out the window. And th this is why, in our field, you know, we we're very much involved with making these measurements all the time. You know, spend spend more time on the bench during your development, and in, in every aspect of this, less time on the simulation because you want to see the, the reality of the converter. Okay, do a webinar with an example of current mode. Okay, we'll do that probably a couple of times from now. Will the slow loop approximate the power stage transfer function? Well, no, when, when we measure the slow loop, go back here, so there's our, we, we're not seeing anything to do with the loop gain here. So we're in, here's the slow loop. We could measure this loop gain and you'd see it crossing over, I think about one Hertz is where that loop crosses over, but you're not seeing anything to do with the control to output. You can inject that way and measure from here to here, but as I mentioned, the signal, you know, at one kilohertz, you're gonna be down minus 60 dB from injected signal to this point here. So you just don't have anything left to measure. And that's why we don't use the same injection technique. But the little technique we use here, let me turn this down, I'll show you that board again. Oops, I've got a spare board here. I brought a spare control board in case things blew up, which they didn't, but uh, not that one. Right, if I want to inject into the control loop, to do control to output with a slow loop, all I do is pull out this resistor here, and then I just stick in a little 1K resistor right there, okay? So if you put sockets on your board, because you listen to me during the webinar, if you put sockets on your next board, injecting this way, according to this diagram, is really quite easy. It's a little uncomfortable. You don't know if it's going to work or not. But we have a 1K resistor and a 4 microfarad capacitor here injecting into that node. So here's a case where you don't need to cut into the main circuit to see the control to output. You know, we, we can perturb the circuit, but you can't measure a loop here because there's no break where we're putting this in and getting this out, okay? So you got, you got to still do the differential measurement to get the uh, loop gain of the system. What were the 50 hertz and three kilohertz settings corresponding to? Um, this is the magnitude of the stimulus. Yeah, that's the magnitude of the stimulus. So up to 50 hertz, let's go back in there. Let's go back to, go to the Ridley box and settings. Up to 50 hertz, we inject four volts. From three kilohertz onwards, we inject 100 millivolts. Okay, so we've got a 40 to 1 drop in signal injection. And then you can change where these points are. I always put this high frequency point just before the crossover. And the low frequency point is going to be somewhere around 50, 100 hertz for, for most cases. And you can certainly move these. Okay, so you're free to move these any, any, anywhere you like. So this is just setting the gain of the signal you know, as you sweep the loop, if you've got too much signal, you, you will know it because there'll be this weird bump and distortion in the curve. And if you have too little signal, you'll know that too, because you just see a lot of hash coming into the system. The right. state in the, the amplitude will diminish between. Oh yeah, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, I've seen some, some of the cheap scope analyzers where they step the, 
the source down between the two breakpoints, but no, you, you've got to smoothly curve it down. Okay, it's crazy to have to, you know, give a whole programmed set point like that. So in the old HP 4194 days, uh, back in the 80s, 90s, we used to sweep the loop, and as it was sweeping, you have the little down button to change the size of the source. So as it gets above a point, you just hit it again, again, again. You're just kind of riding that gain button to drop the frequency down. Now, that was one of the flaws of the 4194. It didn't have this variable source. So when the AP Instruments machine came out, a Alan Phillips of AP used to work for HP. He saw that as a flaw, and he put that variable source in so people wouldn't have to ride the gain button anymore. To make that work but that that's what that's all about in here okay and then if you go fixed source you're just using a one volt source across the entire range okay and by the way we're uh if you look at look at the back here you see how can you see that i'm pointing the wrong way <laughs> my camera's the wrong oh there you go there you go you see our little uh, collection of ridley boxes sitting there It's the size package that comes in, so it just slots in your briefcase or slots in yourself. So first customer ship is tomorrow. Our first customer in Northern California, and uh, get your order in now because I think they're going to start flying off the shelves. So my little sales pitch there. <laughs> they're, they're great machines. I mean, we we just use them all the time, you know, for for teaching now and for you know doing webinars like this. This is so convenient to have one machine that's doing everything for us here. Okay, I don't mind answering questions as long as there's lots of people here. Why is the sound only outputting on the right speaker? It's because your left speaker is broken, I think. Uh, ask him if he has a Mac. <laughs> Do you have a Mac, was the question from John. By the way, I um, over in the wings here is John Beecroft, who uh, works with us in the labs, and he always comes on his webinars. He's answering a lot of the questions for you, so. John and I have known each other for 30 years now, working on Pathwise. We both live here in Camarillo, and uh, I'm sure many of you have met him during our during our courses. Thank you, John, for helping out. So, minimum phase margin shall be 45 degrees. Yes, it shall. If you go less than 45 degrees phase margin, your system gets worse. It doesn't get better. So if you find yourself pushing up the gain because you think more gain is good, it's not. You start seeing a peaking in the transfer functions of output impedance if you drop below that 45 degrees. So for me, 50 degrees is the minimum. If you're getting down around 40, I'm not I'm not happy with that, especially since things are going to change. So 1K or 100 ohm should be used as ZF. Yeah, there's kind of a little discrepancy there, wasn't there in my in my system. So I showed the slow loop is 4.7 mics and 100 ohms. But if I try doing my ZF to match that exactly, 4.7 mics and 100 ohms, you get all kinds of RF noise pick up on this branch. So just make that a 1K, and then it will behave nicely. And when we do our course, you know, here it is on the board, you know, we could have put that 1K resistor on the board, but we didn't know we needed it until we got into the lab and we had the RF setups that we have and the grounding setups we have. So this this resistor is kind of hanging in the air, which is not not too visually pleasing, but that that's just the way we do it. Okay, so the cap goes on the board for injecting. That's the ZF of the cap, and then this is the 1K resistor. And you can experiment with that. If you try a 100 ohm resistor and it it works just fine, then use 100 ohms. But just be aware, in here, in your PWM controller, is a high gain op amp. Okay, maybe maybe 90 dB op, op amp in there. And you're putting that op amp really near to switching devices. Crazy thing to do. Don't then go and hang cables on the inputs and the outputs of the op amp, or even probes. You know, be very, very careful probing this op amp. It doesn't like it. So if you've got a big multi-kilowatt converter and you just touch one of the pins of the op amp to see if it's working, you may blow up your entire converter. So watch out for that. We always buffer our pins with at least a 1K resistor. So when we measure channel C, we put a 1K resistor before that, between that measurement point so that we don't get RF noise into that high gain component there. Okay, just a little tip there for you. Did you flag another one, John? 
manual. Someone will know if there's a manual with a Wiki box. There, <laughs> since I've finished writing it, uh, first customer ship is tomorrow. So yes, there will be a manual by tomorrow. We will have that manual online as soon as it's ready. Okay, so that's that's in process right now. So if you come back next week to our website, you will see a manual there as well. I think we covered all the big ones here. Yep. If you have more questions, feel free to send us an email, ridleyengineering.com. And um, I think we're going to wrap it up here. And hope you all have a good rest of the day. Thank you for coming. Please come visit the website and um, watch out for the notification of our next webinar where we will do some work on the input filter, which I'm really excited about because it's brand new work and we control that input filter electronically. Which I don't think anybody has done that before. If they have, they certainly haven't published anything about it. But we, 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 we put that in our paper for APEC, for the seminar for APEC, which of course, unfortunately was canceled so we haven't actually published that anywhere yet, but it will be on uh, either the next webinar or the one after that. We'll be doing some unique things with the input filter. And that's really important now because power converters are getting up to about 99% efficient. If you then stick a great big LC in front of it, which is you got to damp it and lose efficiency in the damping network, you know, you may have, you, know, you may double the losses in your circuit just with the input filter. So coming up with a lossless way to damp the input filter is, uh, we think it's an important step for many, many types of converters. So we're gonna talk about that. It's kind of a cool thing. And we'll have some LT Spice simulation files for you that you can follow along with that too. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, have a great day and we will see you next time. Thanks, bye-bye.